Okay, we want to welcome everyone to, in their own words, Kansas Veterans Oral Histories. Uh, I'm Ty Edwards. I'm director of the Kansas Studies Institute here at JCCC. This is our second year doing Veterans Oral Histories. We are super excited. And we're starting to sort of know what we're doing. It's really exciting. Uh, before we go any further, though, I want to acknowledge all the veterans that are here today. So if you're a veteran, could you stand up so we could acknowledge you? Thank you very much. All right, so today I want to do a few thank yous before we get started. One to the Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series, one of our sponsors tonight. Uh, the series was established at the college in 1997 and is underwritten by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the JCCC Foundation. This series seeks to educate and empower the public in areas of education, health, wellness, and financial stability. Uh, Norman Polsky was also a veteran, and he served as an infantry officer in the U.S. Marine Corps in World War II. Uh, I want to thank Kenna Zumalt, my collaborator, program director for veteran services here at JCCC. Kenna, where'd you go? <coughs> there she is. <laughs> okay, yeah, there she is. Uh, we have a wonderful time on this collaboration. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Donnie Witten, veteran services outreach specialist. Donnie, can you stand up? Donnie's also a veteran, and he interviews all of our veterans. So all of the interviews you're going to see, you don't see Donnie, but he's doing a lot of the work. So thank you, Donnie, for that excellent work. I also want to thank uh, Video Services at JCCC. So all of the interviews that we do uh, are recorded in our studio by our Video Services staff. Uh, they're edited. They do the clips like that we're going to have tonight. They're also filming this panel that we will also post online and that will also be on JCCC uh, cable channel. So we appreciate all of their work in making such high quality videos. We also post all of these on our library archive so that they can be open access to anyone doing research or looking into these subjects after this. And then, of course, I want to acknowledge our veterans who are here today. So I should say we had a third veteran who we interviewed who is ill and could not be here tonight. So that's Robert Robbins. Uh, I also want to thank Carl Snyder, who's here tonight, and Tim Barnhart. And uh, these are our three interviewees. And you'll hear more from them in a second. And then I want to introduce our moderator, Scott Weaver. He is a retired Army combat veteran who served as an infantry officer, scholar, and strategist. His strategic level assignments focused on Southwest Asia and Europe. He served nine years on the faculties of the Army's three degree-granting institutions, the U.S. Military Academy, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and the U.S. Army War College. Following retirement from the Army in 2014 at the rank of colonel, he became a scouting professional with the Boy Scouts of America in Kansas City. In 2017, he became the president and lead consultant for GCEG Group, LLC. And among his community service activities is serving as chair of JCCC's Community Veterans Advisory Board. So we are really excited to have him with us tonight. Uh, so thank you for your service to our country and to our students, Scott. Thank you for being here tonight. It's an honor. Uh, I also passed out paper. Hopefully, we're going to have everybody, if you think of questions as we're going through, try to write them down. And then after we get through with our panel, we're going to try to collect your questions so we can get through as many of them as possible in our question time. And then if you are students here seeking credit or extra credit, I have a sign-in sheet where you need to write your student name and your instructor name so I can turn those into your instructors at the end. All right, so Scott, would you like to introduce and start? Oh, certainly. Uh, so, of course, uh, you've already done a great job of introducing Carl and Tim, and I just want to share a few facts with you. So, over the course of the 244 years of the nation's history, some 46 million Americans have worn uh, a uniform uh, in the services of the United States. Today, there are 22 million veterans alive across the United States. Sixteen and a half million of those veterans are uh, wartime veterans, and the other 5.5 million are uh, peacetime veterans. Peacetime being a very <coughs> amorphous idea, really, as you get to it, the likelihood that those 5.5 million veterans themselves may have uh, been engaged in some sort of operation, supporting some sort of operation is certainly there, and their service uh, 
whether or not you're called upon, at any point in time, you are there to answer the call. And so there, in my eyes, there's no difference in the 22 million folks between those who saw wartime service and those who didn't. And then the last piece of information is that today, only seven of every 100 Americans have ever worn the uniform of the United States. Only seven of every 100 Americans. On active duty, we have 0.04% of the 310 million people in this nation serving in uniform. Uh, I want to go ahead and we've acknowledged our veterans. We, we have two uh, young gentlemen here and a young lady who is a, a military family member. We have two young men who are future soldiers. And I'd like you, you guys to go ahead and stand up and let's, let us go ahead and acknowledge them. Thank you. So tonight, we're going to go ahead and hear uh, from Carl and from Tim about their time in service. Carl uh, was in the Navy in World War II, and we'll find out a little bit more about that in just a few moments. And from 1943 to 1944, he served in the Pacific Theater with the United States Navy uh, as a turret gunner and a liberator. Uh, the Navy designation for it is a PB-4Y-1 is the aircraft that he flew on. Uh, Tim Barnhart uh, served in Vietnam as an infantry soldier in my combat division, the 101st Airborne. Uh, he was in the 187th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment, the Rakasans. Okay, and, that, and David Petraeus named the 3rd third, third Battalion the Iron Rakasans. Uh, so a little history fact for you, so you're an Iron Rakasan. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go ahead and get started then, if we could, with Carl's story. I'm Carl Snyder, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up in Carthage, Missouri, uh, went to high school there, and then I, uh, when I graduated in 42, I, uh, that's a, in 1941, the, uh, uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, I was working in a filling station that morning. And I called my dad and I said, did you hear what happened? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I think I'm going to join the Navy. He said, I don't think so. You're going to. You're going to finish high school if they'll let you. And so I did. I finished high school, and then along with four of the fellows, I enlisted in the Navy. Took my training uh, basic in uh, Great Lakes Training Center. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and went through uh, turret maintenance school and, and ordnance school. And... Uh, learned uh, something about the turret maintenance and stuff like that. And then we sent, they were sent us down to Purcell, Oklahoma for uh, some hand-to-hand -hand combat training. I spent a month down there with that. And then I was transferred to Fleet Air Wing 14 in San Diego. And I spent some time there. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but uh, I did some training on a, on a, the Norden bomb site at that time, and that was a highly secret thing at that time. So, uh, but they had a, one mounted on a, a a trailer, a tractor effect, that where I was elevated about ten feet off the floor and practiced the using that site. And uh, I was there probably six months. I can't remember exactly how long. And then I was assigned to VB-109 Bombing Squadron, patrol bombers. And I was uh, this is Navy. And uh, we were, this was, patrol bomber 109 was uh, a B-24 
we called the Navy called them PB4Y1s. And so we were uh, training. We went into that. I was assigned to a crew there. And we did some flying out of there to, to get acquainted with the plane and so forth. Uh, did a little bit of uh, aerial gunnery training there, as I recall. And then uh, in, seemed to me like it was November of uh, 43, I went to, uh, uh, were, we shipped out to Hawaii. In December then we went to the war zone and we flew out to uh, uh, Apamama Island in the Gilbert Islands was my first base. And they, they told us if you, uh, when you get there, the first thing you do is dig a foxhole. And they had also told us that that island was, uh, it was 400 miles to the nearest Japanese held island. So we were green country boys. We thought that was a long ways. And so we did, we set up the tent first and got, got our camp set up. About 10 o'clock the very first night, the bombers came over and, and bombed that island, and we lost uh, two planes that night. We quickly got busy and dug us some foxholes, I'll tell you. It was a, that was a scary thing because we had not ever experienced anything like that, of course. Next, we'll go ahead and let Tim introduce himself. Video. Yeah, my name's Tim Barnhart, uh, Timmy Joe Barnhart. I'm from Southern Missouri, uh, down around Buffalo, Missouri. Uh, we moved up here when I was in uh, second or third grade, uh, moved to Raytown, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, the summers, uh, my mom and dad both worked. Summers, we went back down to Buffalo and, and spent all of our summers there. I, so I always consider that my home. Uh, but we went all through high school, everything here, uh, up here in, in Kansas City. Uh, then uh, right after high school, I went to, I did one year down at Warrensburg. Uh, uh, then I decided I probably should be going to the Art Institute instead of down there. I didn't have the money to do that. Uh, one of the guys that was the head of the library down there told me about uh, being able to get an early out. If I went into the service, I could do two years, uh, get early out, and have the GI Bill pay for my schooling, uh, which is the route I decided to try. So I waived all my deferments, and uh, I had, a, had my knees operated on my senior year in high school. So I, I had a medical deferment and a school deferment. I waived both those, and they drafted me right away and and uh, I got to go to Vietnam and uh, when I came back I had to extend a little bit uh, but when I came back I had uh, 150 days almost to the right on it so I, I got out which was uh, and then they paid my way through school which was sort of the plan so I'm gonna go ahead and tell you a, a bit of the rest of the story before I uh Begin to, I've got a couple questions for you both. We discussed them briefly uh, beforehand. So, uh, Carl, after he uh, after he left the Navy there in 1946, spent a few years as a carpenter, uh, but he got his degree and became a teacher and then a principal. And he was in education for 30 years. Retired from that in 1986, and then had a 20-year career in real estate. Okay. And uh, he spent all that time in Kansas City, in Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County. Okay. And Tim, Tim did exactly what he planned to do when he left Warrensburg and, join, and let the Army join him to it <laughs> and uh, served his year in Vietnam, came back, went to the Kansas City Art Institute, and then came to Johnson County Community College, and the rest is history. All right here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Carl, I'm going to start with a, a question for you. And, Tim, I'll ask you to answer the same question a little bit later. But, Carl, 
when you were growing up, you, your father told you you couldn't leave high school to, to join uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. But when you were growing up in your, in, in your high school years, what did you know about what was going on in the wider world? I really didn't know much of anything about it. The, uh, the only, uh, they, had, they had, in the movie theaters, they had what they call short subjects. And these were news items and so forth. And that's about all I knew about it. In fact, I, we knew that, that Germany had taken over Poland and, and some things like that, but it really had not much uh, influence on us because we, we were a long ways away. And uh, that was another world. So we didn't, I didn't think much about it. Okay. Now, Tim, how about you? What was your experience in, in that same, <clears throat> in growing up there in your middle adolescent years? Well, I, I had a lot of, uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother down in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. uh, her son was an anthropologist. Uh, she was really big on collecting National Geographic magazines. I read those a lot. Uh, I really liked the maps. Uh, I was real interested in where my dad was in World War II. Okay. In different islands <coughs> in the South Pacific. So I, I knew what was happening pretty much. I didn't know the conflict in Vietnam was getting to be what it was turning in to be. And it turned out to be until uh, my junior year in high school and I had a teacher by the name of uh, Mr. Hammond, and uh, he got sort of upset with a few kids one day because we were sort of goofing around in class, and, and he got his newspaper out and said, this is what's happening, and, and you guys are going to be over there in a couple of years, so you better start paying attention. So, yeah, we started paying attention a little bit more then. Okay. So that would have been, what, about 1964? 64, 65. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Carl, not, not only were things happening in Europe, I'm sorry. I said not only were things happening in Europe with Germany invading Poland and and and, and a war being declared in 1939 and really be getting started in 1940, but the Japanese had invaded Manchuria in the middle 30s and the Korean Peninsula, and that was that at all in anything that was presented to you in any way, shape, or form as I really that had not had any thought about Japan at all and, and their activities uh, until Pearl Harbor. And in fact, I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. And uh, that day I, that, uh, that the bombing took place there, I was working in a Philly station. Mm -hmm. And when I heard it on the radio, I was 18. I heard that and I said, I called dad and told him, well, you, that I thought I'd join the Navy. He said, I don't think so. You're going to finish school if they let you. Yeah. So we did. And uh, I, with four other guys, joined the Navy in uh, August of that year. Yeah. So we did go on. And I went to Great Lakes mm -hmm. military, to bait boot training. And uh, my, hill, my naval history took off. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were growing up, Carl, were, did you know any veterans or know about any veterans I knew there in of Carthage? Some, I knew of some World War I veterans. Okay. I, I, I knew one or two who professed to have been in the Civil War. But I knew of them. I did not know them personally. Mm -hmm. So... But war was not something we talked about or thought about. Okay. It was just the United States was a first place of its own. We didn't we didn't consider that we we were in trouble, and didn't know it until and the Japanese, as a matter of fact, on the day of Pearl Harbor, they were in Washington D.C. making peace talks, and so that was a big surprise. Mm -hmm to people like me at least. Yeah. Okay. So contrast that, if you would, Tim, with <clears throat> your teacher there in 1964 saying, young men, pay attention. And, and just as you went from being a junior in high school to then being a senior in high school and going to college, 
And you said you, you had to go ahead and let your deferments lapse. So if you could you know, maybe fill in a little bit of the detail there of what was that like and what, what role did veterans play, play yeah, as you were growing up? Well, I never really, I really never thought I'd go into the service. Okay. I mean, I, I was always interested in it. Uh, my dad was really active in the VFW. My mom was. Uh, my sister was the Buddy Poppy Queen, you know. Uh, and so we were always hanging around the VFW a lot. Uh, and when we moved to Raytown, uh, my brothers and I were all on the rifle teams, the VFW rifle teams, and we went down Tuesdays and Thursdays, and, and we shot. My brother got to be really good at it, uh, my older brother. So, uh, so we knew how to, to handle ourselves with, with, with rifles and things like that, but, mm -hmm. the, but as far as going into the military, I really thought that I would go on to college okay. and, and, and go that route, and... Uh, it it wasn't until I got down into Warrensburg that I, <clears throat> I started realizing that that kind the kind of art they were trying to teach there was more for teachers, and I wanted to do fine art. Uh, and the teachers were encouraging me to go to the art institute, but I had didn't have that kind of money. It was, it was Dr. Ford, the head of the librarian, that basically said you could go in and and get the GI Bill and did it pay for it. Right. My dad had done that after World War II with the, with the GI Carpenter School. Okay. And uh, I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's what I did. The, the deferments, like, I, I got injured in playing football. They had to operate on my knees. So I had a, I had, uh, a school deferment because of uh, being in school. And then I had a one Y because of my medical deferment. And I had to lapse, I had to say, that's okay. Wave those, and then they pick me up right away. Okay. Thank you. Carl, when uh, we talked a little bit, you said that, and I asked about the, and we discussed briefly that exposure to, to veterans, and you mentioned that the things that you did know about war or conflict, that those had been presented to you really through movies. Yes. It, well, tell us tell us a little bit more about movies because we you know, now we live in a world of podcasts and YouTube. But but what was what? How did you get that information then? Only when we went to the movies, and that was usually on a Saturday. But we uh, were watching those short subjects that they showed, which were short flicks of the of the war. That's what's happening in the. The development there, as I said, in Poland and, and that there's a area over there. Uh, but it really kind of went over our head because, or at least mine, I didn't, I didn't relate to it. I didn't know what I should think about it. Uh, I knew about Poland, knew where it was, and all that, but I did not have any history with with knowing about the area at all. And Tim, what was it like now going forward from 1940 to 1964, 65, Harry Reisner, Walter Cronkite, The Evening News, uh, and film and reporting from Vietnam there. What, what was that like in, in terms of your awareness of the possibilities? Honestly, in high school, I was into sports. Okay. I didn't watch much television. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't pay that much attention to it, to tell yeah. you the truth, until Mr. Hammond started saying, you really ought to start paying attention to this. And, and then by then, we were studying World War II. I started reading a lot of, a lot of books about what was happening, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but I didn't have a really good knowledge of what was going on over there. I had uh, a few, uh, captain of the football team, uh, after he graduated, uh, wound up in the Army, and uh, he was at Quezon and got killed. And I, I had a few friends that mm -hmm. that had happened to, and, and I, so I knew there was a major conflict going on over there, but I honestly didn't pay 
that much attention to it. Okay. Yeah, and I and I ask because I, I reflect on my own growing up. So I was a very young man in <laughs> 1966, 67, 68. Uh, uh, but remember the moon, you know, remember the uh, the Apollo missions and and all of those things. But I do also remember seeing then the evening news right. and and how that made an impact on me just a, as a child. And of course, I had lots of exposure through all of the World War II movies and things like that. Everything that was taking place, I had plenty of World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam era veterans surrounding me in my life, and that was a subject that was there. And the newsreels, that two, three, five minute newsreel that you would see on a Saturday at a Saturday matinee with maybe the serials that would follow on from that, right? So you start off with the, you had the newsreels, you had the cartoons, and then you had the main feature. And that was really even, in the 1960s, in the mid-60s, you still got a flavor for some of that, as well as then the evening news. But a very different world than what we see today with 24-7 news coverage on multiple channels. Right. So a very different world. Um, if you could, Carl, share maybe what's the one of your most memorable uh, stories are one of the most memorable things that happened to you uh, there uh, serving with uh, VB 109? Probably the most memorable was uh, a, we had, uh, were stationed at, at, as I said before, at Appamama, or it was on the clip, at Appamama in the Gilbert Islands. And we got information, intelligence that there was Japanese shipping in the Kwajalein Bay, uh, the head in the atoll, and uh, they these all these ships were there. That we, they put together a, a squadron of eight uh, planes to go up there and, and bomb those ships. They needed one plane. They said to come in a little late behind the rest of them, so that uh, they would keep the fighters on the ground. And so they asked for a volunteer crew, and our crew volunteered to do that. They told us that it was, it was going to be very uh, dangerous part because we would go in, they'd be all stirred up by the time we got there. The rest of them would get there in secrecy. And, and so about 70 miles out from the island, we dropped down right on the water, the whole squadron. Just just above water level, and uh, flew that last seventy miles to stay below radar. We were close enough to the water that I was getting spray off the waves on my window on my turret. I I flew in the belly turret, hung down below the plane, and uh, when we got to the island, we came up high enough to get over the trees and back down, and went down this airstrip. And they were shooting at us with everything from pistols to rifles to, to, to the other. But we were moving that, that low and that fast, we were hard to trade on. But as we were leaving the island, well, we, we knocked five planes out of the air that were trying to take off. They didn't get any planes in the air. We, looked, we laid a string of bombs down the airstrip. And as we found out later that uh, they were never able to take off on that airstrip again because others kept going back in and, and harassing them and they, so they weren't able to get the construction done to get the airstrip back in shape. But as we were leaving that island, one of the, evidently it was a, a 37 millimeter or something, I don't know, hit our outboard engine on, uh, on the port side and uh, on the left side and knocked it out. And so we were supposed to rendezvous with the rest of the squadron after their run on the ships. But the pilot told the navigator to set a course for home because we had lost that engine. We had to get some altitude to head for home, which we did. And uh, after 
a period of time, I don't know how long it was, but a short period of time, an engine on the other side of the plane, the inboard engine on the other side of the plane, uh, developed an oil leak. Evidently, it had been hit by a, a line, had been hit by a bullet. And we developed an oil leak there, and they had to feather that engine, which means they had to turn the props going into the wind so that they didn't windmill on us. And we had reached an altitude probably 10,000 feet, something like that. We weren't going to gain much more altitude after that. We were on two engines. We got orders from the pilot to throw everything over the, out of the plane that we could get loose. We threw the radio gear and everything that, that we could get loose in the plane. We threw it overboard to lighten the ship. We uh, were probably, oh, we hadn't sighted the island yet, our base. And uh, the pilot asked the, the mechanic to give him a reading on which fuel. And he said, Skipper, we're, we're on fumes. I haven't been able to get a reading for five minutes. Wow. So it wasn't long after that that we came in sight of the island. And as I said, we had no radio gear. So we had, we had what was called an altus lamp, which was a spotlight with a trigger and the radio man was able to send signals to the tower that we had to come in straight. We couldn't, we had no fuel to go around. There was a plane just ahead of us trying to land, and uh, they finally got it out of the way. We were coming right in on top of it, mm -hmm. and they finally got him out of there. He was going to try to land ahead of us. And we landed and rolled maybe a third, possibly a half of the length of the runway, and the other two engines quit. <laughs> so we, we were very happy to be on the ground. <laughs> about, I, I'm thinking about two weeks after that, we got a, I got a letter from my mother. She wanted to know what we were doing on a certain, at a certain time, a certain date. And... Uh, it was that day that we were on that mission. Mm -hmm. She said, I said, why? Uh, well, she said in a letter that she woke up in the middle of the night uh, with the feeling that she needed to pray for us, yeah. pray for me. So she woke my dad up and said, Carl, get up. We got to pray. He said, why? She said, I don't know. Carl's in trouble. So they prayed until they felt comfortable going back to sleep. And uh, we felt like we came in on a wing and a prayer after that. Yeah. Uh, but it was a, that was one of the most harrowing experiences that I had. Our plane was pretty well shot up that day. Yeah. Had lots of holes in it. Yeah. And fortunately, not a soul on board got hit. There were 11 of us on board and nobody got hit. So we were very fortunate with that. Well, thank you. Well, Tim, how about you? What was your, <coughs> you have a, a most memorable story? And you did some, you did some interesting things. Yeah, we did a lot of, lot of different things. Uh, I, 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 seeing the tigers scared me. Uh, <laughs> well, tell us about that. And smell. Uh, yeah, first, first one I saw was at the fire base, uh, Bastogne. We flew in. A, we'd, our unit was all over Vietnam, up and down. And, and, and in, in October, we moved up north to Hue, and then they moved us out to the different fire bases. Uh, one of the first fire bases I landed on was a, was a Bastogne, and uh, it was an established fire base. There was people already there. Uh, we didn't have to build it, but it looked down over this river, and, and there was a big tiger that walked out of this jungle and out onto the sandbar, and and I couldn't believe it. Uh, I'd never seen one in a while before, and uh, and the, and the door gunner, the the, the pilot, the, the chopper pilot, actually flew down there and shot it, 
And then they tried to put it on the chopper and they couldn't lift it, it was too big. They flew back up and asked for guys to come down and help them and some guys went down and they loaded it up and brought it up and I was standing up there on the chopper pad when it came up and I was, <coughs> it was just odd how big a teeth they had. <laughs> and after that I was sort of scared of tigers. Uh, but I, I was out on a listening post later on after we moved back down into uh, Coochie area uh, Plain of Jars and Hobo Woods, that area. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I went out on a listening post one night with one other guy, and we were out, and we was out a little too far, I think. Uh, but, and it was dark. It's really dark there, and, and, and you could hear it all night. You could hear it come in, and you smell it. You smelled it first. It smelled like wet dog. And, and then you started hearing hear it all around you all night long and that uh yeah we just sat back to back <laughs> and we kept going i wonder if m16 will stop one of these things i i just knew when it was going to get dragged off but it never did and uh and then a couple other times i ran into them they i think the tigers sort of scared me the most uh i mean really put a fright to you yeah <laughs> well carl you got you're sitting next to two two paratroopers, uh, and so we had the you know we lacked the good sense to stay in airplanes, and jumped out of them voluntarily with para, with uh, with packs on, uh, parachutes. But I understand your wife told me that you actually jumped out of an airplane too. You did it in Hutchison, Kansas. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was another no no. <laughs> We were, uh, I, I had, uh, it was after I came back from the war zone, and my nerves were pretty shot. And we had to fly for at least four hours a month to get our flight pay. And so we, I usually tried to find a, a flight that would be at least that long. So I didn't have to go but once. And so I got it in my head one day that that plane was going to crash. The thing is that uh, it, we were in a training situation for pilots, and the flying out of uh, Hutch, we'd fly up around Omaha and back, and on takeoff, a lot of times the instructor pilot would reach over and cut an engine, and the pilot had to recover the plane on takeoff. Another thing that they did, we did a lot of stalls and they'd bring the plane to a stall and it'd hang up there and shake like that and finally fall off. Well, back in the plane, we knew what was going on. Right. And I got, uh, I got the feeling that day that the, that plane wasn't coming back. So we were going down to the airstrip, and we, I was going down the taxi strip to the takeoff point. And we had reached a point where we, we weren't moving very fast. I don't know, maybe just past walking speed. I don't know how fast we were going. But anyway, I opened up the tunnel hatch and I bailed out. And uh, they saw me from the tower, saw me go out. And they called the pilot and told him that he'd lost a crew member. <laughs> so he went ahead and took off, did their trip, and they got back just fine. <laughs> well, they came down from the tower with a jeep and picked me up and took me in. And I, I got, had to go to captain's mass the next day. And I got restricted to base for a month. <laughs> and I got packed my skin up, places patched up. And, but uh, the interesting part of that. According to Mega Catch Mosquito Traps. Ooh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought I had it turned off. <laughs> uh, not long after I got that. A sentence to be for a base, stay on the base. They came up with an announcement they need volunteers to go to Jacksonville, Florida to go to turret maintenance school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, that's my chance. I'll go down there, get out of this. <laughs> so I did. I went to Jacksonville and showed up there and uh, went into the 
just got in and got my got rid of my duffel and everything. And they came over the announcement over the intercom and said, Snyder, report to the Master at Arms Shack. I thought, what in the world? Well, I went into the Martin's Master at Arms Shack. Turned out that I wasn't in a, in a different outfit. I was still in Fleet Air Wing 14, and I had to serve my sentence there. <laughs> I had to, had to pick up cigarette butts all over the base. <laughs> so, Tim... You have this fascinating story about leaving Vietnam. So you just take us right there. So you had, you had extended for 30 days to go ahead and make sure you had less than 150 days left when you got back stateside. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I had, I had extended once, and then I still was going to miss it by just a few days. So I, I extended another time. And uh, some of the officers were really okay with that. Others weren't at all. Uh, and so I, I finally talked talk this guy into letting me do it. Uh, but they were, uh, we'd been going out on these Eagle flights every day trying to find where the NBA were uh, while we were up there. That's what they called them, Eagle flights. And uh, the small, small groups. And uh, Charlie Company ac actually had ran into a, a pretty good size group uh, up on this uh, Dom Dong Up by mountain, uh, uh, and it, and it escalated fairly quickly into the Hamburger Hill, mm -hmm. big big fight, and so uh, everybody was going out there, and so we we loading up, getting getting ready to go, and and I I ran into one of the pilots uh, who was. Uh, uh, Honeycutt was our battalion commander, uh, Blackjack. Uh, he was Blackjack's pilot, and he, uh, uh, Colonel Reardon, and Reardon goes, uh, and I'd spoken to the guy several times, so he, I knew him, he knew me, and uh, he goes, what are you doing going out? I thought you were going home, and I'm going, well, yeah, but I extended, and he says, no, you're, you're going home. Uh, just don't get on the chopper, just go on back in. So I went back in and told uh, Sergeant Camarino that uh, he said that I should probably be uh, going on home instead of going out. He says, no, nobody's going home. Everybody's going out to the hill. <laughs> he said, uh, but by then everybody pretty much left. And uh, so he put me on berm guard duty that night. And the next morning he said, if you want to try to make it down the way, you can. Uh, but... Uh, there's nothing going down that direction. Uh, so uh, <coughs> there was a highway out not too far from the base camp, and I went out there, took a clip of, took a clip from M16 and walked out there and hitchhiked on down to Way and waited around down there at this Air Force base until there was a sortie flying south down to Tonsonut and got a, hitched a ride down there. And then I got over to... Uh, our base camp there and uh, signed out of the battalion, signed out of the 101st, and then I was just in the regular army. And uh, as soon as I did that, I thought I'm pretty well free by then because then I could go home. Uh, and I did. Uh, I, and I made it home for Mother's Day. Yeah. So that, that's what uh, Colonel Reardon said. He says, hey, your mom, Mother's Day is coming up. Your mom wants you home. Go on home. Get out of here. You served your time. Okay. So that was really nice of him to let yeah. me do that. A lot of guys would have said, get on, get on the plane and get out of here. I mean, get on up there. But <laughs> yeah. So Carl, you got back. So did your time, did your time there in Jacksonville. You, uh, you were uh, discharged from the Navy and began the rest of your life. So as you got out in that first four or five years, there, there were millions of, of veterans at that point in time. But what was it like in that first half a decade, that first four or five years of, of separating from the service, the, the war's over, and you're a veteran? And what, what was it like well, and what for, did it mean for to you? about six months, uh, six, uh, what, six months, it was a short period of time, 
I was having a hard time finding a job that I liked, what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. In fact, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we went away to school. Well, we went to Bethany Nazarene College in, in, in Bethany, Oklahoma. And when we got down there, there were a lot of veterans, like you say. Mm-hmm. My wife and I had gotten married. She graduated high school. We got married the next week, and uh, we took off that that fall for school. And uh, as I said, there were uh, there were a lot of veterans coming in. My brother and another fellow didn't have a place to sleep. They ran out of the dormitory space, so they were sleeping on the floor in the gymnasium. So my wife and I had been uh, allotted a, a small uh, old army trailer. It was an 18-foot trailer. Hmm. And so if you opened up the doors to the cabinets, they made a wall. So our bed was there. The kitchen was at the other end. And the table let down on the, on the seating, and that made another bed. So these two guys, my brother and another guy, right. lived with us for a couple of weeks, I guess. We were newly married. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> uh, anyway, that uh, we uh, we finished school. Well, we didn't finish school, but we got my wife got pregnant. We got uh, at the, after three years, and I quit school to pay the bills. And uh, of course, she was home taking care of the baby. And uh, the uh, that I, I start I got to work with a a carpenter and I became a carpenter and uh, I worked there in Oklahoma City and for a couple of uh, firms there and then we moved back to Kansas City and uh, so it was I, I worked in construction as a carpenter for several years. And I just got tired of that. In fact, I didn't like the what I had to put up with in, in the, in the uh, construction business. The guy they had me partnered with was always teasing me about the, the pastor was at my house taking care of business while I was here working, hmm. stuff like that. And I just got tired of it. So I quit. Came home, told my wife, I'm, I'm through. And I talked to a superintendent of schools in, in the Wyandotte County at that time. He said, I've got, I need you a job. And so he put me to work. I had no education hours. So he, uh, we got lined up with, with o, uh, KU to get the courses I needed to be prepared for that fall to go to work. <laughs> And I did. That first year, I had 47 kids in a fifth and sixth grade combination. I was wall-to-wall kids. <laughs> and I mean, literally, my desk was here. I had kids sitting alongside me here. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I did that for, I was three years there, and then I, I had an opportunity to become a, an assistant principal in an elementary school, I did that. Yeah. And the next year, I got a school of my own. And so I was 17 years as a principal in an elementary school. And then the superintendent called me one day and he said, Carl, how do you think about the, 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 where you are? And I said, I like my school. Got a good staff, got a good PTA. I like it here. He said, well, I, I, I'd kind of like to have you go over here. And, and to, what do you think about junior high? I said, I don't know think anything about it at all. I'm pretty well satisfied where I am. <laughs> I really thought I had a decision to make. Mm-hmm. Well, we talked for a little while, and I found out I didn't have a decision to make. <laughs> I'd go to junior high. <laughs> and I did. So yeah. by that time, I was at the top of the pay scale for the, for the group. He said, I can't give you any more money. I can give you a little cigar money. I said, I don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> but I went there anyway. And uh, so I, I did that for, well, 
after about three years, we converted our junior high to middle school. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with that through 10 years. The last five years with that junior high, they, they, there was an elementary school on the same campus. And that principal left. I don't know what happened. But anyway, she left. So they talked, knocked on my door. He said, want me to take that? I didn't have an assistant principal there. I had an assistant at the junior high. And he said, there's nothing to it. Anybody can do it. I, I take a teacher off out of the classroom, put her over there. But he said, I want you to. You've got experience. Well, it was all together different. You wore a different hat right. all together. <clears throat> anyway, after a year of that, I convinced them that I needed somebody there. So they gave me a, someone to train as a principal. So they, I had the last three years of that, I had uh, somebody in that office. So I didn't have to run back and forth all the time. But anyway, that's, and then I had told my wife earlier, I'm going to do this education thing for 10, for 30 years, and then I'm going to do something different. And she said, okay, just like, you know, I know. <laughs> well, the 30th year came up, and uh, it, about Christmas time, I told, turned in my resignation. I said, I'm through. And I went to real estate school, and I hit the ground running. I sold a, sold a house before I ever got out of out of my office at school that How summer. How about that? <laughs> so, but anyway, I spent 20 years then in real estate. Okay. Well, very good. And I got to where I couldn't climb stairs anymore, so I gave that up after 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, 1969, you come back from Vietnam. <laughs> I don't think it was the same as it was for, uh, for veterans coming back and at, at the end of World War II. So can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I, I think a lot of my friends had a lot of, a lot of problems. I, I never did. I, I, I came back and uh, that summer I started working down at the Art Institute, right. uh, going to school down there. And the people down there were, there were, they were so focused on their art I don't know that very many of them knew much about <coughs> current events or what they were doing. And most of them didn't know. There was two other veterans down there that were in doing, going on the GI Bill, but mm -hmm. the rest of them were, were younger kids and they were mostly doing their art thing. Okay. Uh, so I, I really never had any problem with, with, with people uh, Knowing that I was a vet, veteran, uh, probably a lot of them didn't even know it. Uh, and I d didn't talk a lot to okay. people. I just w did my work. I had a motorcycle. I rode my bike a lot. Uh, that summer I took off and went, rode the Mexican-American border all the way to, uh, to Los Angeles. and. Uh, to California and then back or up to the Southwest. And I, I was out camping a lot by myself. I didn't, nobody bothered me and, okay. and I didn't bother anybody. And so I, I didn't really have the problems that some of my friends that went to some of the bigger schools had, okay. uh, where I think there was a lot more free time and the kids were really doing a lot of anti-war protests and things like that. I, I really stayed out of it. Uh, I, I had I had one girl I dated once whose mom uh, told me she really didn't like me dating her daughter because I'd gone to Vietnam, but because she didn't didn't know if I was stable or not or something I don't know, but it didn't bother me a whole lot. I thought it was really odd, but that was the only time that ever ever came up that I can remember. Uh, I didn't have the like big problems with yeah. it at all. all right. Well, I've asked all the questions so far, and I think it's time to go ahead and yeah, let our questions. folks. Yeah. If you have questions, questions, can you just raise them up? Ken, uh, Ken is going to pick them up, and then we'll try to <coughs> compile and get through them as quickly as possible. So wave them up in the air. Ken and I don't always have our glasses on. <laughs> we can't see you. Okay. Awesome. 
Thank you. All right. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Let's see, Carl, you were talking about digging your foxhole. Dig what? You were talking about digging your foxhole. Fox or Tim, hole. was that, yeah, your foxhole that you dug when you were first, your first night, you know, you were told you should dig a foxhole immediately, and then you built a tent instead. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing what the little yeah, understanding. Scott, can you help? Maybe you can help. Sure. Me. So, Carl, when you, uh, when you're, when you landed there forward on the island and you were attacked that first night and digging your foxholes. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Yeah. How big was it? Just big enough to get in. <laughs> <laughs> get, get your head below the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, Carl, what, what islands did you see while you were in World War II? Well, I saw the Gilbert Islands. Mm -hmm. I saw Kwajalein. That's, that's the airstrip that we bombed uh, and all the shipping was in. We spent about a month there. Then we moved up to Anawetok. Uh, and then we spent a couple of months there. And then we, we went from there up to uh, Saipan. Mm -hmm. And we came home from Saipan. We were in the war zone eight months. Mm -hmm. Tim, you talked about your art several times. Um, did you do any artwork while you were in the service? And what kind of artwork did you create after the service? Um, while I was in the service, I, I was I carved a lot. I had a little, I, I I had my knife with me, and I I would take ammo boxes and carve chains out of them, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. People would buy them. <laughs> uh, I didn't do a lot of drawing while I was over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I do graphic design. I do a lot of graphic design for the, for the college here. Sure. Do posters, mm -hmm. brochures, things. Mm -hmm. Could you both talk about what contact you had with your family and loved ones while you were in the service? I wasn't a very good son. I did not write home. <laughs> I got I got a letter, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe once a month from Mom. But that's about it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything, and anything we tried to get we, was uh, censored. If, you, if there was anything in the letter that looked iffy, they cut it out. So a lot of their letters just riddled with holes. <laughs> right. Uh, right. But uh, we didn't have the kind of contact that they do today with all the... Skyping and all that sort of thing, where, mm -hmm. where they have instant contact with the, with the people who are in action. Mm -hmm. But it was, we were just away from home, that's it. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't very good about writing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, in fact, I was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, do you want to talk about how you contacted your loved ones while you were in the service? Uh, my dad would. Uh, my dad was in the service, and and I think because of that he he wrote me almost every day. Wow. He I, he would send letters. I I would get the letters some sporadically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes would be out in the field for for extended period of time. We'd come back in. I'd have 15, 20 letters there, you know, which was sort of nice. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I would always try to write them every day. I would try to write some little thing and then mail it home. And, uh, they're pretty generic letters. Uh, my mom, which was real nice, my mom saved every letter I wrote home. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a shoebox full of every single letter and I can trace where I, mm -hmm. everything I did, which mm -hmm. was really nice. Uh, and then when I got a chance to go on R&R, &R, I went down to Australia and, uh, and I actually made a phone call home. Uh, and that was the only, only, the only time one. I got to call. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for one last question. So could you both tell us what you think the best way to thank a veteran for their services? Repeat. Yeah. What's the best way to thank a veteran, in your opinion? Just thank you. 
mm -hmm. for your service. That's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just thank them. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it doesn't really matter what you do in the service. If, if, if you're in the service, you really deserve a thank you. Even, even I know I was a little prejudiced against people in in not in in the line unit and the mm -hmm. lines, yeah, uh, the grunts. But boy, without without all that support, we we wouldn't have anything out there. <laughs> you wouldn't have the ammo. You wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't have somebody taking care of the records for you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much stuff they do, and I I really appreciate them a lot more now and towards the end than I, than I did going over. Mm -hmm. Going over, you you know, you're studying to be 11 Bravo, or you're going to be an infantry guy, and you get over there and, you know, and forget about the guys in the rear. But, boy, w without them, you'd, you'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> all right. Well, we want to thank all of you for coming. If you are students and you need to sign in, don't forget to do that. And let's thank all of our veterans for sharing their stories today. Thanks again.